It was very nice for the opportunity that Argon has uh, provided to me to be here today and to share some of the wisdom that I've amassed over my crazy career. So I am the owner of Sunrise Dental Laboratory and uh, my lab specializes in full mouth reconstructions. And it all started with my passion to find how to fix implant dentistry. Back in the analog days, it was our role as the technician to restore really poorly placed implants. And I got a lot of those done. I had to show off there because my son made this for me and I was pretty proud of him. It was a, he started at 13 to find his passion and he wanted to learn how to do video games and do VR. And he uh, had a startup that Facebook ended up acquiring and he has done really well for himself in digital. It was really disappointing when he chose not to join my operation, but I'm so proud that he chose his path and he knew it. I bring that in because I believe that we all have to know where we start in this trade. And I'm gonna share a little bit about my background. Uh, I left home at 17 years old. I thought I knew everything, typical punk kid. There was two things that I liked to do. I liked to surf and I liked to fish. I was a horrible student. I went through school. I never cracked a book. And I still graduated high school with a 3.8 GPA. I had no clue what I wanted to do in life. I just knew that I needed to make a move. And somehow I walked into a dental laboratory at 17, applying for a job as a driver. Way back in the day, 1985, I would have never thought that I'd be standing in front of a group of esteemed colleagues talking about very complex, multidisciplinary implant restorations. So as stated, I am the owner of Sunrise Dental Laboratory. We're a little bespoke lab in Southern California. I've been doing this for a long time, guys, and most of it I was with my hands. The last 20 years exclusively, I've had some sort of digital touch to it. 2002 was my first year that I started into uh, digital dentistry. Obviously, I specialize in imp implant dentistry. I want to do all restorations that have titanium in it or a hole. That's my goal. I have exclusive digital CAD CAM workflows only. I am a father, I have two wonderful kids as stated. Um, somehow I have a wife that still sticks with me. And I have two wonderful dogs and I'm an avid golfer. So this is my mantra in life, guys. It's not just in business. I've failed so many times in so many things and I attribute it to me getting back up. This is a quote from Samuel Beckett, and it resonates with everything I am. Ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again. Fail again, fail better. Now to me, that's a really telling statement. So often we want to just show our successes. Today is gonna to be no different but my success may be measured in a different manner. I'm gonna show you failures. I'm gonna show you three cases that I botched in some way. Even with all the wisdom and all the expertise that I have in this industry, I wanna show you how we overcome challenges. I think that's the most important part. You can go to every lecture with pretty pictures, perfect cases, and learn absolutely nothing but be inspired with art. That's not what you're here for, guys. You're gonna, gonna have very few of those real cases in this world. So let's talk about a few things. I'm gonna start off with a couple shout outs to some people that are very important to me. The one thing I really stress in my life is the importance of relationships. Relationships to me is everything. I've run my business on that motto. I do it to this day. I try to run my life with the same person Relationships are everything. It builds who you are, and it's important, guys. This gentleman here is my best friend in dentistry and my number one client. If any of my other clients are in this room, I love you too. <laughs> but there's no 
telling that this gentleman is everything to me. He has changed my life. He has reinvigorated the idea that caring matters and to give everything and to own yourself and what your part of the equation is. I'm not getting that case out the door, guys. I'm owning it, believing in it, and I'm doing everything in my power to make sure it's successful. Second set of group here that we have are the gents from Instariza. These guys have an interesting workflow that I'm going to outline here, and I recommend that if you're interested in more in this system, please go by and see them. They're a powerful group of guys that are doing some fun stuff, innovative workflows, and I'm going to touch on much of it today. Art and Fernando in the middle of this uh, photo are just very innovative people. I believe in them. I, I support them. And I wanted to give them the respect that they, they garner. So we all know full arch dentistry is super complicated, right? I guess if it was easy, everybody would be doing it better. There's a lot of crappy full arch dentistry being done out there, guys. And if you're not prepared for the future, the retreats are going to be astronomical, the amount of cases that are going to be redone. And you're going to have to be able to think throughout the box with critical thinking to improve where these fixtures have been placed. How often do you see on social media just horrific contours, horrible intaglios, and somehow it's screwed in the mouth and it lasts halfway decent? And then you have a really nice case screwed into place and it fails horribly. Well, guys, we're looking for the biggest opportunity for success and setting digital workflows that work is what I'm about. So what I'm about to uh, present may make it easier or harder, I guess, based on what you are looking at. But it's a concept, guys. I'm not telling you this is the only way to get to the finish line. It's just one that we've utilized for the last two or three years with hundreds of arches that have been successful and efficient. I'm not here to stand up on the stage to tell you I'm the most aesthetic technician out there. But what I will tell you is I'm the guy that's going to find a way to design this for it to last. These patients are horrible with their hygiene. They get to a point where they're never going to clean it properly. So I got to give them a leg up somehow when I develop my contours to be able to solve that, right? So what we're going to talk about most, and this is the concept that we have to understand as we're going forward in our treatment, is how do you control that one coordinate challenge? So essentially, in a nutshell, what it's going to be is we're going to take some pre-surgical records. And then we're going to have a multiple subsequent scans that we're going to stack on top of it that need to correlate together in the original format for us to connect all the dots. It's just spatial, right? It's math. Every STL has an XYZ coordinate. Well, if we can maintain that coordinate, make our pre-surgical wax up, go forward and connect the dots with surgical acquisition of data, we're going to have a very streamlined approach to a prototype. It seems so simple. Why are we fighting it? Why are we doing all of these things to validate our workflows? Well, let's go through it. So we're going to start with the first case, and I'm going to walk through what we do in my laboratory and the data that we acquire. This lovely lady presents with a full mouth of terminal dentition. We take multiple photos of all kinds of different uh, views to evaluate the data. Now, over the years, everybody has used photography of some sort, but we're going to combine it with facial scanning to allow us to manipulate the data, plan. You know, it's not as easy to take a surface scan and jam it into a photo. Yeah, you can do it. But that 2D aspect distorts. So the power of the facial scan is amazing. So let's look at the data. So again, profile scan. And we have to open the bite. 
she's overclosed. So we're going to take a leaf gauge and we're going to uh, build up this posterior and we're going to lock in the bite with some bite registration. And we're going to spray down the shiny surfaces of these teeth with some scan spray and we're going to capture a, a, a facial scan. We're going to do three sets of facial scans, guys. We're going to do a retracted bite scan. And when you're utilizing a facial scanner over an inner oral scanner, your depth of field is mine just amazingly bigger. So meaning, when you're scanning the face, you're going to be able to get deep into the buccal corridor to have more precise bite alignments. All right? Second one, we're going to do a Duchenne smile, and we're going to do an exaggerated smile, and we're going to correlate all that data together to be able to aid us in design a pre-surgical wax-up way before the surgeon ever picks up a handpiece. So as we look through this uh, incoming records, we get to evaluate the dentition and, and, and really get our first look at where our plasty lines are going to be on this case. As a technician for years, as a denture technician for years, it was my job to learn how to extract teeth, how much bone to contour, how to make these dentures fit. It's no different with digital. The digital aspect is you have to be on the same page with your doctor to be able to design your prosthetics for strength, durability, longevity. So everything starts in my laboratory with a video from my client. It's generally uh, anatomage being open uh, with a CVCT that he's laid in some fixtures. This gentleman does everything freehand. He does not do any guided or stackable or anything crazy. He's exceptionally skilled, and this isn't for everyone, guys, but I'm going to show you it. So we reviewed the data, and we can see a lot of correlations on what we're going to do and usable data, and I'm already thinking about how I'm going to correlate future scans to the preoperative condition. Look at the teeth. I have a communication with my client. I, which ones are parallel involved? Which ones are stronger than others? Which ones are going to have some movement with additional scans? We chart all that. And then we look at interesting things. You know, this is an older lady. She's missing a bicuspid. You know, it's generally not congenitally missing. It's generally how they used to do bad ortho back in the day. But what it tells me is this case is going to be a zygoterigoid case. And I need to know where my terminal dentition is going to go from here. So that's another pearl that you can see here as you look at the data. It will aid you in your wax up. You're not just going to mimic what's there. But the aid of the facial scan is going to allow you to learn so much more and set your teeth more appropriately. So it's no different than setting a denture in a lot of ways, guys. It's kind of a lost art form. If we look at it in, uh, practically and think about it, back in the day when I first started uh, setting teeth, yeah, we'd get a nasty mush, mush bite, and we'd have to look at the adjacent uh, morphology and, and make some correlations and set our first centrals in and hope we're in the right position for everything else to follow. As I started working with better clients, they would fox plane that rim, I put it on an adjustable articulator with a face bow, and I would have a really good starting point to know where to go. Well, the really good starting point today is the face. There's nothing better, guys. Everything is dictated by the face, and let me show you why. So this is the correlated scans between the upper and lower interoral scans and the face. It's going to give me so much as I can rotate around this uh, arc I'm going to be able to see the profile scan, but most importantly, and here is the really key here with facial scans, is you can see the lip support based on the preoperative condition. And if you're keen to look at that aspect, you're not going to change this person's appearance. You know, they're an individual. Yes, we want to improve it, but we got to be able to use this information to guide us to do this pre-surgical wax up. So I have a design library that I'm going to outline later, but essentially what it is, it allows me to bring in multiple arch forms, scale them, place them in the face, correlate to the intaglio, and move forward with our surgical acquisition of data. I'm not redesigning these cases every time, guys. I have a library of close to 100 arches. 
all of them categorized by the same things that were fundamentally taught to me as denture technician about facial proportions and tooth morphology. If you go back to the day of uh, dent supplies, uh, mold guides, square, square tapering, ovoid, square tapering ovoid, all of these had a correlation to the molds that you would use for the dentures that you'd made. And all that data is still relevant today, so what if we had a design library that was easily two or three clicks to bring in? Pretty awesome, huh? So let's move on. So this is our wax up. We brought it in in full complement of teeth. It's ready to roll. The intaglios are managed based upon the video that my client sends me that communicate the plasti line based on the proposed implant placement. I can get very close to where we're going to go on surgery day based on that data. But I have a very easy way to adapt that as the surgical coordinates come in. So we're going to take this and eventually create this. And that's the fun part, guys. It's just a few clicks to get to that part with good pre-surgical planning. So let's run through a case and show you how it's done. So again, if you are unaware of how digital workflows work and to maintain our one coordinate challenge, we need to have a common fiducial that's going to carry along our multiple scans as we move forward. So what you see in the palette of this, uh, this upper arch is a one-piece implant, Norris one-piece implant, and it's actually just the carrier on it. The blue material that you see there is a material called Scandar. It adds topography and aids the scanner in acquiring the data in an accurate manner. Well, what does that really mean? If you've ever scanned with an IO scanner and you see it capturing the data, capturing the data, and then stalls, and you have to wiggle it around to get it to find it again and go, as soon as it stalls, guy, that scan's worthless. It's not accurate. It might be fine for a flipper or an aligner or something inconsequential. But anything with precision, that scan is worthless. So we find a way to trick the scanner into acquiring the data in a more precise way. The camera is great. You have two challenges with an integral scanner. The depth of field and aligning one picture to the next. Essentially, that's what it's doing, guys. If you're scanning and capture a picture at this particular point, and that triangle is right here, the next picture comes and might have a little blood, might have a little tissue that's moved. Well, it can't correlate, and that's why it stall stalls. So the more topography that you can add to it, it aids the scanner in tracking, maintaining, and stitching the entire scan together accurately. So we're going to use this fiducial. We're going to add this into the palette. And it's going to allow me to take this surgical scan and align it back to my preoperative scan, teeth to teeth. And when I align it teeth to teeth, I'm going to pick those teeth that we talked about that have the best stability so that we can correlate that data and get that fiducial in there. Because we're going to lose everything here soon. We're going to cut all those teeth out. We're going to do plasti on it. We're going to put implants in. So we're going to lose all that physical data that we have to carry over. And conversely, on the lower, we're going to do something similar but different. So on the lower, we're going to do a big plasty, so we need to segment the arch. So we put that implant in on a more horizontal plane, below the plasty line, so it's going to be out of the way. We add that carrier on there, much like a scan locator, and capture the data. Do another scan. Send it in. Align teeth to teeth, and now we have our fiducial. Surgery's done, and I bring these surgical photos in because I know many of you guys have never seen surgery done well, let alone comprehensive, tough, very multidisciplinary, very difficult surgery. Saigo, pterygoids, most difficult surgery you can do. That's all I really restore. That's what goes to this gentleman's office. We do crazy stuff. 
So you can see the pterygoids, you see the reach, you can see the palatal uh, single one-piece implant that's in there. The carrier is off, we take that off so that we don't disturb that implant. It would be a really bad day if we bumped into that, if we moved it, if we somehow tweaked it in any fashion, because then we've lost everything. So we gotta find a way to keep that as low a profile as possible. And the only reason we have that extension coming up is when we acquire the data, we wanna have that depth of field even, or more even with the height of the scan bodies. So you can see perfect pterygoid placement. And here's the real secret sauce to getting Passivity, guys. You can see very clearly we have our uh, scan bodies in. This is an older case. We did it kind of with two different things, and you're going to see that the lower is slightly different. We were using desk scan bodies at the time for this. They were tall. They allowed us to lock in a lot of scandar around them because we want it rigid. And literally, guys, if you couldn't scan this in the mouth, you could unscrew this in one piece and scan it in a de desktop scanner if you really wanted to, if the office had that. But we're having really perfect success with passivity doing this technique, but absolutely the one thing that makes it happen is understanding the scan path. I'm not gonna teach you that. That's something that InstaRiza guys should, should teach you. So please, if, you, if you're really interested and you wanna go down that route, go, go look, look them up, they're amazing. So you can see our fiducial in there. Now we can see our, our uh, scan bodies. We'll bring that back into the CAD software. It'll align our first fiducial to this fiducial that was already aligned to our preoperative. And now we have our preoperative aligned to our surgical scans. Our implant coordinates are there. We're ready to go now. All we have to do is run it through wax up bridge and connect the dots. Super fast, efficient but we need one more piece of the equation, right? How do we know where the tissue's at? So we gotta get a tissue scan of some sort, and uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it, and I'm gonna share what we do. But these are just beautiful surgical photos that I wanna post. If you see the tenting screw in the palette there, we'll often use multiple fiducials. Uh, once we get to this point, we can remove that one piece implant. It's not necessary at this point because we're gonna align the surgical tissue scan in a different manner. So if you haven't ever seen a zygoma placed, this is the wild trajectory that you get to reach that part. The skill to be able to take this long thing to go through and into the eye, or avoid the eye, is pretty damn impressive. No guide, no nothing, physical land part, skill. This guy has my respect to the point that you have no idea how hard this is. I've been to multiple different cadaver classes. I've worked with uh, new doctors looking to learn this aspect of it. And it's daunting. It's tough. And it's really interesting to me with the advent of social media that three years ago, nobody was posting remote anchorage sites. Very few Zygo cases were shown. Now it seems like everybody and their brother is trying these cases. Some are really doing some horrible work, but uh, but anyhow, I wanna show you something that is perfect, so you can put it in your mind's eye and, and, and know that this type of dentistry can be done. So let's click through. A lot of fun surgical shots here. Okay, so this picture is how we're gonna acquire our intaglio. You can see he's pulling the buckle fat pads out over the top of these zygos to protect them during healing. We're gonna have some suturing up over that. And then we're gonna take a very specific impression. Seems counterintuitive, right? We're doing all this digital, but now we're gonna take an impression. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a very high durometer putty. We're gonna load it in a stock tray. We're gonna go over the top of these healing abutments and that compression of that putty to the soft tissue is gonna give us our compressive state for our intaglio. Well, you may be asking, well, how are you gonna align that? You have no fiducial in here to align back. 
Well, the fiducial is the healing of abundance. We have a library that is specific that takes our healing abutment to align to our scan body. So we already have our scan bodies aligned, so now we're going to bring the tissue in. And ultimately, we're at the place now where we can bring in our wax up, finalize the intaglial contours based on the tissue contours, add our implant coordinates to an order, and output our prototype. Very similar on the lower, you can see, I, I want to go through this just to show you the importance of good surgical execution. This is a traditional all in four distalized ter terminal, so a couple straight anteriors, but what you want to learn from this slide is how the arch form is leveled. That flat part of the bone takes 10 minutes to plasty down, and it gives everything to the technician and the patient to develop hygienic contours. If you're not making these things flat, guys, you have ups and downs to the ridge, you're going to add inaccuracy to the prosthetic, and it's going to be a challenge to make the intaglios cleansable. You're going to see me hammer that through on this as we move through, because it is imperative that you follow the rules to give that patient the best chance of keeping it clean. They sure as hell didn't keep their regular teeth clean, right? So now you got a big chunk of Zerk in there. How are we going to ma maintain that this is going to happen? So you see those uh, black marks. That's a, what we call a sterile carbon marker or a golf pencil. And he uses uh, that to aid his visual. The most uh, incredible thing about this gentleman and, and implant dentistry as a whole is how do you maintain your visual? You have no landmarks. You have all these teeth out here, and you're going to have to find a way to get these implants in, in symmetry, and get it to be in the right part of the bone. That's awesome. No guide, no nothing. All you're doing is looking at the data, really just dissecting that CBCT, and making good plans. It's amazing. It's very difficult to do, and that's why guided is more, more welcomed. It's easy. It's like a security blanket. You feel better about it. Stackable systems, hey, they're awesome. And anybody getting into implant den dentistry that needs a handhold, jump into Stackable. You are going to learn your tuition on it. You're going to pay your tuition because you know it's very expensive. But it aids you to get better all the way along the way. And you can be a bigger part of your team to be involved in that. So again, multi-units is a, one of those things that are, are under-discussed. So often with multi-units, uh, it's based upon what the office has in stock for the surgery. And so often, these surgeries, you have to pivot. And when I say pivot, you have to have options. Once you place a multi-unit, once you impress that at that multi-unit, if it's in the wrong position, guys, the wrong cuff height, wrong angle inclination, yes, we have all kinds of tools to be able to fix that aspect. But nobody's going to change out a multi-unit in between the prototype and the definitive to aid it, because then you have to acquire all new records. It's just not going to happen. So a full complement of, of parts and pieces in your office is important. So we're going to suture this thing back up as well. And we're about ready to go to the prototype. And we're going to just jump right in and see what I call a failure. So what happened, guys? I've worked my ass off to, to keep these alignments just perfect. We got teeth the next day. We got passivity, which is awesome. We got a little side shift going on here. This is what I call manageable occlusal outcomes. Anybody that states that they hit their bites bang on perfect every single time with a full digital workflow is lying to you. There's nobody on this planet that can be perfect with that. We can get very close and we're getting better every single time. And the whole reason I'm here today is to try to share some wisdom for the things that I've stumbled on to make your life a little bit easier. 
If you gravitate to take this back to your laboratory, share this with your clients, I've done my job. I can feel good about coming to Chicago in February, fighting a cold and, and getting through all of this aspect to be here to talk in front of this crowd. So let's look at this. These prototypes look pretty damn good in this relation. This is next day. Next day after a brutal surgery, human body's pretty amazing. She comes in, we screw these to place. We have a little bit of equilibration. Yeah, and we see a little tiny side shift. Big deal. But me, I'm gut punched because I've worked so darn hard to get this to be perfect. But what we find is every time you take any object in a line, you're going to have a standard deviation based on what that camera can provide. It's the weak link. The IO scanner is the weak link. We know that. But it's powerful enough to be able to get you to this position and allows you to move forward to the definitive with very minor modifications. You're not redesigning everything. You're going to be smart about it, and I'm going to show you. So it's not horrible, and I guarantee you this lady is thrilled that I've had to obscure her eyes because it looks like she's been in a 10-round fight with uh, Tyson, and uh, huge black eye, just horrible. I felt so bad when I saw the photos, but uh, she was thrilled. She came in. She has teeth now, and it's not so bad. All right, so let's jump forward to uh, how we're going to acquire the next set of data and how it's going to be powerful for us to modify our restorations to get to the final. So you see three sets of scans up here. We have new tissue scans. These are the healed intaglios. We have those special healing abutments on there again that are going to allow us to take this align back to our implant coordinates from our pre-surgical workflow. And we can adapt our wax up bridge again in a much pleasing manner. But here's the secret sauce on uh, how to align the bites. And I guarantee that this is going to be a different concept in your mind to think about. And it's going to be a little difficult for me to explain, but I'm going to do my best. So the middle picture is the scanned adjusted prototypes in the relation of the passivity that we have on each restoration. It shows that little minor side shift, shows whatever minor adjustment that they made. But what it correlates is this. We're going to take our wax up bridge in, and this is going to be our parent scan. So everything's going to line back to this known coordinate that we have here from the beginning. Then we're going to take this combined output of those prototypes. It's one STL. I've combined it. And the goal of this is as I align this to my pre-surgical wax up is to get the lower coordinates in the best position. Well, what does that mean? So what I do is I combine the output of my implant coordinates, so I scan bodies from the time of surgery and my wax up in the given relation that we thought they should be at. And now I'm going to line this over. And you see very clearly that side shift that we saw. So how do we accomplish this? What do we change on this? All I have to do is rerun through the pattern with these new implant coordinates. It's exactly the same spatial coordinates. They just shifted. So now, if you really think about what bites are in implant dentistry, it's not the correlation from arch to arch. It's realistically implants to implants. So if you have passivity on arch, but the bite is off, and you have a pre-surgical wax up based on known good data, it's very easy to correlate how to move that wax up by just moving the implant coordinates. That was an aha moment for me. When I figured that aspect out, it took all of these cases and made them considerably simpler. Still a challenge. It's definitely easier when you have the static arch, the upper arch that's not moving, and the dynamic arch that can move in all of these directions 
this is the one you want to work on the most. If you nail the upper, you're home free. You have that data to correlate back to, and all you have to do is adjust the implant coordinates on lower, rerun the same pattern through your wax up bridge, and it's going to be in perfect occlusion. How many of you are going crazy now thinking about that? It really is an amazing trick, and once you learn how to manipulate additional scans and maintain your spatial coordinates, you absolutely will become a better technician. So let's show the final, and again, I'm one of those guys, I build these restorations for longevity. I don't put glass on any of these things. I put a little bit of liquid ceramic on it, and I try to make them as aesthetic as possible in a monolithic state. It's not easy. Conversational distance is uh, amazing. They look like teeth. You know, big 40-foot monitor. Yeah, it's pretty flipping hard to make it look perfect. It's not a 15-powder buildup, guys. But what it is is a functional perfect occlusion aspect case that's restoring dentition and allowing this patient a new lease on life. And this is what I live for. This is why I get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. This is why I say I get to go to work rather than I have to go to work because I am so invested in this amazing ability to be able to transform lives and be part of a team that can do this. When I started my little denture laboratory in my garage, working seven days a week, 13 hours a day, trying to do something better, I knew that if I worked hard enough, I'd find a way to make a difference. I made a promise to myself at that time, since there was no anybody giving back in this trade, that once I got to a place in this trade, I was going to give back freely. I was going to try to share as much as possible, because I fell down so many times on my way up, it's going to be better if I can take, ease the pain, give it away before I take that dirt nap, and literally just share the wisdom. That's what it's about, guys. So we got a ha happy patient and uh, years younger. And she's thrilled. Huge difference in this lady's life. Is it perfect? Not even close. Is it pretty damn good? Yeah. I have never had one case in my life that I said was perfect. The day I do, I want to say I'm going to hang it up because it's a rarity. You know, I learn something from every case, and I enjoy the challenge to get better. All right, let's go into case two. This case two is, is even more complex, and I made even a bigger stupidity move. And I share it freely. I have no ego with this. I, I think that I have my digital pass worked out really, really well. I think outside the box probably better than just about anybody. I still screw up. So I'm going to show you what I did. So I came up with a path for this. This lady comes and presents to uh, Dr. Amin's office. She has no teeth, nothing. She's got a bunch of implants in her mouth. At one time, she probably had some dentures of some sort, but she has nothing. She's been functioning with nothing, and now she's ready to do something. So we got to take some records and start. So of course, profile, we see super overclosed. The lip is completely collapsed in. There's nothing supporting anything, right? It's horrible. Floor of the mouth is right there. She's got two uh, nasty implants on the bottom that are going to be extracted. And she has six fixtures up top in the posterior. It was really common back in the day to do a weird lift and jam in three fixtures back there and retain it. So now we're going to do something kind of cool. So we can't just move forward into digital workflow without substantiating some data, right? So the fun part about digital is you have the ability to easily manipulate data to correlate it. But what does that mean? Well, this slide shows two poorly acquired surface scans of uh, two arches that were really tough to scan with the inner oral scanner. And then we have this massive ball of putty that we call a mush bite. 
very much like old denture days where we're going to try to just simulate some sort of vertical and centric relation that we could use to correlate because now in this digital workflow we have to find a way to make a fiducial correlate back to our, our pre-surgical, right? So the cool part about this is we have this big ball of putty here and we're going to facial scan her. So we line everything up, put it in the face, and the face tells us this is where we're at, and we got a big chunk of material in there that it gives us the data to be able to make a denture wax up real quick. Nothing fancy, but we're going to utilize this to correlate that acquired data, meaning we're going to see if she can tolerate that vertical dimension before we pick up the surgical handpiece. We're going to bring it in and we're going to use these dentures also to be able to aid us in collecting our fiducial output, right? We have to have something to correlate back. We have an intaglio on these dentures now that are substantiated with this fit. It's one record, guys. I mean, literally, this would be a home run with most people. We've got a big ball of putty, jam it in the mouth, acquire a scan, align everything up, use my denture analog background to set teeth based on landmarks and we send this off for our second set of records and our second set of records are going to consist of some cool stuff but again we have failure and the failure is side shift and the side shift comes from that big ball of putty that is aligning to those poor surface scans that are going to be rotated one way or the other. It's not perfect. You have a compressed version of the putty. You have a mucostatic compression of the scan. We have nothing in compression at that point. So it's going to be a guess when it comes to that. In hindsight, I should have just segmented out the intaglio of the putty bite as my starting point. And I wouldn't have aligned anything back, aligned it to the face, and been home free. But again, this is manageable. This is going to allow me to now take a second facial scan. Scan in this position. Recorrelate the data based on this information. I'm not going to change the damn wax up. I'm changing the face and the position to the wax up. I'm not starting over, guys. So here's my finished wax up for this case based on this re-correlated data. And we're ready to rock. Surgery's coming. Now how are we going to get the fiducials on this one? This one's a little interesting. We have six common fixtures up top, guys. So in my infinite wisdom, I came up with a super smart plan that backfired royally. So I said, why don't we just scan those six fixtures first? We're going to have a correlated data there. Get that scan. Take the denture and cut a window and see that scan body all the way back in the back. And then I can take those six fixtures, align it to the one fixture. And when the surgical day comes in with the nine fixtures, I can correlate it back. Boy, what a brilliant move that was, huh? So does anybody see the error here? I didn't for the longest time. I looked at this case over and over once the failure happened. And I just didn't think clearly enough about it. What ended up happening on this case, guys, is the one scan body, it's round. It's not engaging. And it's going to rotate. So when I have the six other fixtures and I correlate it back to that one thing, it's going to align to the z-axis. It's going to line on the side of the scan body, but that flat side on that scan body is in a different position because he took it off. So now I have those six fixtures that may be perfectly passive, but it's just rotated it a little bit. What an idiot move, man. I mean, literally, I just didn't catch it. All we had to do is grind another hole on the opposite side of the arch, leave another fixture over there, boom, we're done. So don't do this. But this is what we ended up with. So the lower is a little bit different. We're going to add a fiducial on this. So we slather up the intaglio of this uh, denture that was mildly fitting well. And we're going to reline the hell out of it and add this uh, adhesive to it. 
And we cut this big notch in here because we're going to add that horizontal fiducial and allow me to use my denture wax up to correlate to my fiducial, which is again is going to correlate to my surgical coordinates. So this is the trick, guys. We already got this thing waxed up. Everything's pretty much solidified with this information of data. All we have to do is maintain the coordinates along the way to get to the final prototype, right? So surgery day comes, we put three more fixtures in and we're looking good. But now we have the daunting task to acquire an IO scan with nine fixtures and get passivity. Doctor does a bit of a graph back here, clean some things up. And we slather a bunch of Scandar in there and screw in our scan bodies and we're going to take our final implant coordinate scan. Your inner oral scanner can capture this with passivity with extreme precision, if you know what you're doing. It also can spit out some really crappy data if you don't. Learn this part, exploit your scanner for the power that it has. It's a tool that most of these guys already have in their office. They want to use it. There's a million different ways to acquire implant coordinates utilizing this same method. And there's nothing wrong with it. They're, they're all awesome. You know, PIC, iMetric, Micron Mapper, those are the three big ones that are out in the market today. And most of them are super hard to acquire and another 40 G's to get into. So acquiring that data with that technology works. It's great. I'm not against it. If you've got it, use it. It's wonderful. It simplifies things. But you can get passive restorations with iOS using strategic techniques, and that's what I'm here to share. So again, we get this implant coordinates, we coordinate it back, we suture again, we use the healing abutments as told, we align it with our special library, and we move forward to the lower arch. We're gonna just zip through this real quick. These are the newer scan bodies. This is a little bit different, and uh, it's just a different library, and this is their component that they're selling, so we, we use it. Use that horizontal fixture placement as our fiducial that we're going to line back. And we're ready to go to make the prototypes. And what happens? Exactly what I said. That rotation on that first scan body kicked me in the nuts so hard that I just gut punched that entire day. We got to make this work. We got to send this patient home with teeth that she can function with that are not going to be detrimental to the long term integration of these implants. So we have to do and make it manageable occlusal outcome. Sounds like a fancy term of just getting it by, but it really is just that. Is it horrible? We had to do some creative lower modifications. And what I'm going to tell you is. You have to remember what the whole point of the prototype is. It's our sacrificial appliance that we're essentially going to learn from. We're going to try to do our due diligence to make that prototype as close as possible initially. But we're going to learn from the fact that we are going to see correlations of data that we weren't ready for. So what do we do? We equilibrate. We sacrifice the lower, we grind a little bit more there. Hopefully we don't drop the VD to beyond, but we just establish the VD with a simple mush bite, so how close can we really be? The best articulator in the world, guys, it's not on the computer, it's not in your hand, it's your head. Putting these in the mouth and letting this patient function with them for a certain period of time, you're gonna learn so much from the wear patterns of this material. Every one of my cases that are going through this protocol are in the mouth for five to six months before we move forward to the definitive restoration. You see these guys online pushing for faster, faster, faster. Let's get to the final restoration. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever the hell it is. Stupidness. You can't learn enough with that. That's why so many of these people are complaining about 
zirconi clacking together and, and the bites being off and all of this headaches that are associated with full arch dentistry, it's based on rushing. Work the prototype. This lady's thrilled to have teeth. The midline's a flipping mile off and I'm going to fix it very much the same like the last case as we move forward. But our reveal is pretty decent and we've learned a lot from this and we're going to take those simple records again as we move forward to the final new facial scan and re-correlate re that data and validate the implant coordinate to implant coordinate to get the bite correct. So now we got the final restoration. It's finished up. We've made some minor modifications again. I am not looking to be a leak holt. I'm looking for somebody that's going to make this thing last forever and own it. That's me. We're constantly pushing to improve our material. We utilize Argen uh, Zirconia exclusively today. It's predictable. It's highly aesthetic and translucent in a monolithic state with very minimal external liquid colorants. We utilize Mio and Soprano in my laboratory, but there's no glass on this at all. And if you look at the occlusal scheme, I'm managing the curve of speed, curve of Wilson to get the occlusal aspect correct. And what I didn't really touch on in my library is all of it's based on denture morphology. The one thing that I've found with these types of cases when it comes to posterior occlusion is we all want to have those deep cusp-foss relations with these beautiful libraries that we have at our, our beck and call. But what we find is the off-axis hitting on inclined planes cause that clacking. It's harmonics at that point. It's not a flat piece hitting together. So if you substitute your posterior molds for more of a 10 degree or shallower cusp-foss relation, you're going to have much more predictable outcome. It's a little harder to equilibrate because you have a larger contact point, but it allows that patient a greater deal of function than to have those deep cusp-foss relations. So a little pro tip when it comes to that, I believe in this concept called uh, long centric, meaning that they're not locked in. They have a little bit of freedom to move in this, this aspect and the flatter your posterior occlusion is going to benefit. You need to compensate with your curvus V and curve of Wilson to be able to over overcome those shallow uh, cusps. But this is our outcome. So as I talked about the intaglio, it's super important for us to recognize that these patients are going to clean these. I need to give them a leg up, so I'm going to make these things as hygienic as possible. While I glaze the intaglio, which many say is inappropriate, I'm doing that to seal any porosity out, and then I polish the living hell out of it. It's a mirror when I get done with it. It is so smooth that plaque is going to be very difficult to adhere to this. These cases may come out every six months if they come back for recall. I know many go MIA right away. So I want to do everything I can to make these things not just be a dirty diaper. So polish those intaglios, guys. Lower, very much the same. I don't want to be repetitive, but I can't tell you enough about how we go about making them last. Everybody wants to worry about how to make them look pretty. So she's thrilled. We're pretty good. Looks pretty damn decent for monolithic zirconia, right? We got good contours. We got good surface textures, refracting the light. And anybody that's photographed full contour zirconia knows how difficult it is to make it look good. This isn't bold up. It looks a million times better to the human eye. But what this shows is it allows me to take a little bit of extra data from my prototypes, manipulate that data, change my occlusal outcome based on the implant to implant coordinate, and bring in that existing wax up in that perfect occlusion that I've done. And this lady is just absolutely thrilled. She never thought she would have a smile like this again, and I feel 
great again. So I go through the gut punches to feeling like I made a difference. I think that's what all technicians do, guys. But so many of us, once we fail a few times, we don't learn from it, and we're not going to try and improve. OK, this final case. This case is still in the works. And I'll give a little backstory here. I get a call. I start at 4 AM every morning, guys. I'm an early riser. I like to uh, uh, service my clients on the East Coast. I live in California. So I, my phone starts ringing at 5 AM. I don't go into the office. I have a home office that I do some designs and some administrative work in. But my favorite client, again, knows that I'm up at that hour, so he calls me at 5 AM. And he says, John, I have some fun for us. And that's always a scary thing to hear. So he sends me this through WhatsApp. And he says, hey, um, we're going to restore this case. And we're going to do it with fixed. And I'm looking at mandible, and I'm thinking, where the hell are we going to put an implant? And I'm looking at the hollow maxilla, and I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do here? It's impossible, right? So he says, we're going to do a remote anchorage on the upper, and we're going to do a subperiostinal on the lower. And I'm thinking, sub? Who the hell does subs? I don't do those. It was 1995 when I got my first plaster impression of a, an exposed uh, arch form that I waxed and cast something for a local surgeon that walked me through the process. It was the biggest piece of shit I ever made. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made five more just like it. <laughs> and I swore that you know, I would never do those again. The technology was just too rudimentary, and it was tough. There was guys that were excellent at it. You know, there's still guys that are doing that old school technique. Um, I think Randy Root is one of the, the main guys out there. And today, more people are using laser centering to do these types of cases. Well, I don't have that. So I was looking for any opportunity to pitch this to anybody that would take it, because I just, I got enough work. I don't need to do this. But I love this dude. And I'm going to do everything in my power to connect and find a way to make this happen. But that didn't stop me from reaching out to everybody that was doing these. And everybody told me, no, can't be done. I don't like when people tell me no. I, it forces me to find a way to say yes, especially to the people that I care for. And that's what happened. So we're going to collect some data again, guys. And uh, this lady comes to the office super overclosed, you know, floor of the mouth. If you look at her face and think about where that mandibula is, and if she bumped into a wall, it would snap in half, right? So she has a couple crappy set of dentures here, you can see. And if you look at the floor of the mouth, it is flat. There's nothing there. It's nothing. Well, it looks like we got some bone here, but that's just butter and a lot of thick, flabby tissue. So how are we going to get records? And what the heck are we going to do? And how do we move this together? And how the heck do I design this digitally for me to reduce this? So we start by stabilizing the dentures. And we stabilize it with green mousse. Green mousse is radio-opaque. So I'm going to be able to align this back to my CBCT that's going to aid me in designing my sub. So once we stabilize the denture, we leaf gauge again, we open it up, we acquire an open bite, we facial scan, and now we have two correlated sets of data. We have the IO data correlating the upper and lower together, and we have the facial scan data that's correlating the bite together. We double check. And this is our starting point. I have three pieces of data. I have these dentures. I have the CBCT. I have the CBCT that's going to show that green mousse in it. That's radio opaque. And I can line everything from that. And this is my canvas, guys. I, now I've got to figure this out. How the hell am I going to make something work on this? This, uh, this lady has the flipping nerve exposed on the lower. I've got to make this sub high water. I've got to be able to make this sit on this scan in a tripodial format. If you don't understand what a sub is, it's going to be connected in three pieces, but essentially it's the tissue that's holding it in place. 
we're retaining it with some bone screws. It's not integrating into the bone in that manner. It'll notch the bone, but it's subperiosteal tissue. So what do we do? Well, we're going to segment this out and buy some time so I can figure out how the hell to do the lower. So I said, let's segment the treatment. Let's do the upper arch and design a wax up that is going to connect the dots, go back to uh, those remote anchorage sites and make a denture for her on the lower. This will buy me some time to figure out how to do the sub. And I won't go through all the steps, but we essentially connect the dots and we make our prototype and we deliver it. And the bite's great. She's working great. But again, remember what I said, when you have a denture that's floating around, you have an upper arch that's fixed. It's very easy to have those to come into occlusion because it can move. It doesn't necessarily mean that our data is perfectly accurate. It just means that the patient can adapt. I guarantee if you looked at those other dentures that she had when she's coming in, she's more or less manipulating with muscle memory in her tongue to move it to position to hold it in place. So now the secret sauce and the fun. Hours upon hours of me working three shape to try to figure out a module that I can design this sub in. So here's my outcome. I take that wax up and now I got to reverse out some sort of superstructure for it. And my goal is to make this fixed. Most subs have a removable denture over it was holding in with O-rings of some sort. This lady wanted fix, I wanted to make fixed for her and I was going to be damned if I couldn't make it happen. My goal was to have it as hygienic as possible like all my appliances. So again, I take it into each of the modules. You got to realize the fun part of digital design and utilizing software that was never ever really intended to make these type of prosthetics. That's the fun, man. I, I dig it. I like to exploit the technology to make it bend to my will. So we got that tripod going on. And the challenge is not just f rendering a pattern. The challenge is how the hell do I get this off of my mill? This thing's huge. The offset's huge. It's high. And it's titanium. And I'm sure as hell not a machinist. I'm a pretty good denture tech that knows how to mill stuff. So it took me a lot of hours to develop the design based on my ability and my machine's ability to output the part. So that's a lot of fancy geometry right there, guys. And ultimately, this is our ended pattern. So initially, when I thought and designed this uh, pattern, I thought, well, I'll just do a reductive pattern, add some stock multi-unit abutments, screw them to position, and we're home free, right? So I'm here to be completely honest. I screwed this one up too. Let's talk about it. So if you look at this one, I started thinking, well, the worst thing that can happen with a sub is have it fractured. You can't fix that. And you got to take everything out if that bar ever fractures. So having a 2D cross section going through a multi-unit where you're going to have a hole that's going to be drilled in that is really risky. So I said, I'm going to figure a way to make the pattern, connect the multi-unit in one place, mill the multi-unit, drill and hand tap it. And if you've ever drilled and hand tapped titanium, you know it is difficult, very risky. And a very fine thread like that is not getting the taps off of Amazon. I can tell you that right now. So I thought it was smart. I took a design library that had an analog of a multi-unit. I reversed out the, the interface and I brought it in as an attachment and I made this bar and I'm thinking I'm just the shit. We design it up, I send it off to Ramsey, he looks at it, he thinks I'm a wizard. And I send it to the mill. And it comes out pretty damn good. 
hours upon hours to cam this, to be able to get it to fit, not crash tools, to be able to get the reach on something like this in a 98 millimeter disc that was just barely wide enough to reach the existing Ramus. A lot of hand finishing to this. You know, some of these horizontal things cannot be milled. It has to be done by hand. But I still haven't revealed the kick in the nuts. But this is the finish off of my mill. Yes, I'm pretty proud of this. It took a lot of hours to come up with this, especially when I have never done one of these digitally. It was awesome. So I get to this position, I got them tapped, I got on my med bench and I start thinking, well, it's probably gonna be smart if I just put this on my printed mandibula and go ahead and screw on some scan locators and acquire the implant coordinates here rather than just do a simple bullying separation. And then I find out that something really bad happened. So I grab the, the standard desk scan body that we use for multi-unit abutments and doesn't fit. It's not even close. It's oversized by a millimeter and a half. I started thinking that multi-unit abutment looked a little big, right? So in my infinite wisdom, as I picked the, the library parts, I did not correlate them to the restorative parts. And the library was flawed. You put the analog in it, put the tie base on that analog, do a 2D cross section, and it was colliding on one another. I was pissed. I wasn't pissed at anybody other than myself for not validating that. So now I got this beautiful sub that's finished at this point. I need to make the prototype on it. Surgery's coming up. I certainly can't go back and remill this thing and redesign it. So am I going to compromise or am I going to be innovative? Well, I think you know what I'm going to do. So I'm not one of those guys that have any thought about going direct to multi-unit in Zirconia. I just think that it's risky. There's no reason to validate it. Anytime you have a volumetric change and going direct to fixture, uh, there's potential for bad things to happen. Can you make it work? Yeah, but any volumetric changed material in my estimation has a risk, so I'm not going to do it. But for this prototype, I can come up with a way to just do a bowling subtraction, separate out my channels, acquire a long prosthetic screw, the uni abutment pros screw uh, 1.4 is taller, so I can make my screw seat in the PLMA thicker, and I mill it out. And it fits like a flipping glove. No problems at all. And this is my piece of jewelry, my passion, and my favorite client's hand. And this one just kind of kills me a little bit because I get choked up over the fact that I put so much hard work and passion to come up with a way to solve this equation for this lady. And surgery day comes. And to me, it was the worst day of my life because I did not feel confidence. It's new. I, I haven't done them. What the hell is going to happen if this thing doesn't fit? How is he going to pivot? How is he going to feel if he has to send her home in that denture? It was horrible. But this master gets it in. And you can see one little challenge there. He snapped off the head of one of these bone screws. <laughs> she might not have had very much bone, but it was dense as hell. And all of these bone screw holes were all planned surgically to know that we could engage it without causing a potential fracture to the mandibula. That took a lot of time, a lot of cross sections, lots of time to be able to do this. So if you see what this is, we're going to take all this tissue, tuck it under the bar, go around these uh, tripod features, and we're going to send her home with this prototype. And of course, 
often get seeded exactly the same way in our plan. But again, those manageable occlusal outcomes, that's one I want you to embrace, guys. If you ever come from the days of transitioning a denture and cutting out a flange and trying to round out an entangler and looking at your work when you get done, you could be the best denture technician on the planet. But if those teeth were set with a flange in mind, you will never ever get that prototype perfect. But we didn't care. We utilized that information and just went straight to the final. Well, now we have all this information. We have techniques to get close. That's what I embrace, guys. But I also embrace the confidence that I can take what's close and make it near perfect. So as mentioned, this is still in the prototype stage. We have acquired the new records that's coming in. I'm going to show you a, a couple of uh, uh, tissue healing spots and what the bar looks like now. So that's the projection coming off the ramus that uh, comes there. And you can see the, where the extension was in your mind's eye. And that tissue is just amazing, beautiful. And this thing is skirting everything just perfect. We got a little tissue overgrowth. And part of it was due to the fact that the way he sutured this case, and he would be completely frank to tell you that he made a mistake on it. And he had to cut down the flanges on our prototype so that it wouldn't pinch on that tissue. And that just aided the tissue to grow up and over in some areas. But we got something to hook up a bridge to, guys. Solid. That's impressive on a mandible like this. And we look up the upper arch and it's very similar, just perfect execution. The zygos are healed up beautiful. The tissue management is amazing. And we take those records. And this is what she's been walking around with for the last six months as we figure out what we're going to do as we go forward. And you might be asking yourself, well, John, how are you not going to half-ass that final and make that zirconia straight to the multi-unit? Well, guess who made some custom tie faces? Well, I did. So now we're prepared. We're ready to go forward. And uh, I'm going to share a couple other pearls now. Hopefully, this inspired you a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about dimension. Dimension, to me, had always been with the doctor not giving us enough room. They didn't... Uh, Reduce enough was the biggest challenge always as we we're moving forward with these types of cases is, Doc, you didn't reduce the bone. But dimension today is much different. We're running out of prosthetic dimension to fit into discs. We have these long anchorage sites. So we have to pivot to be able to think about how we can fit these large prosthetics in a 98 millimeter disc. I just barely got that sub in there. I certainly don't have a way to mill anything bigger. And that's why alternate means in digital technology to laser centering or any other type of manufacturing in an industrial format is warranted at times. But if we think creatively, and this is the biggest change in full arch dentistry, is the advent to embrace a two-stage, or what I call a bar and sleeve. Arjun reached out to me in the alpha stage, and they're offering milling services for bars. Well, I mill bars. You, you saw the crazy geometry I milled. But what I also will tell you, as a business owner, I want my mills milling things that are profitable. And loading up a bar for six hours, I could be milling a lot of other products that are working well. Yes, I got redundancy. Yes, I got multiple, multiple mills. But having a reliable partner like Arjun is invaluable. So I sent them a few STLs, and uh, this is what comes back. It's pretty damn nice, really good quality stuff. And how I utilize this stuff is in a split file. Once the prototype is finished, guys, I don't want to have to redesign anything. We have this patient in, in our position. We're happy with that. And I'm going to bring it into a third-party software called B4D to segment out the intaglio of this bar. And again, 
function over aesthetics. Does it look pretty decent? Yeah. yeah I'm not going to stand up here and say I'm the best. It's good. So advent of having a, a new technician in my laboratory, I've been very lucky to acquire um, Min Tran. He's come to work with me and he is a partner in my laboratory. He's into photography, wonderful. He can take some really cool photos of my work and I hate him for it. Because I've had the luxury of having old eyes and things seem to look better. <laughs> but now with the advent of a big macro lens, I can see every imperfection. And it's allowed us to learn a little bit and share with the ceramist and, and look at the things that we can improve. But it does give you the, these really cool photos. And we can learn so much from them and improve our art form. And boy, gold looks always cool, huh? So I go through this to try to spur the moment to, to make you recognize that there'll be times where you're not going to get that zirconia to fit in the disc properly. And if you can support it with a bar, you're going to be able to get the pattern for these multi-gradient materials and nest the pattern horizontal and not have to worry about the access or the potential of the machine to crash. So we're going to use that. It's an advantage to us. So a few more money shots of this. It was a case we were proud of. Okay, here's another solution that we're using the bar module for. This is a poorly done Zygo case. This is not a, 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 an amine case. And you can see that uh, the two on, on the left here uh, were in the palette. And in this configuration, it's manageable. It's great. It's smooth. But when we made the prototype, the tie base is right there. And they're big. There's a big roadmap and big speed bump everywhere. And the patient hated it. He said, why do I have this? I love everything else about it. And so again, into B4D, segment out the bar, use the strength of the material to get to this position. Chuck this to Arjun. They mill it up, send it back to me. And we're ready to finish the case up. It's awesome. So guys, I, I'm not here to say anything other than the things that I believe when it comes to partnering with outsourcing people. You have to make sure whatever they're going to send you is going to work. But you got to be able to send a file that is managed. And if you do, I can promise you, if you partner with Argon for this type of stuff, you're going to be able to get some amazing results. I've, I've been really impressed with what they've done. None of this stuff is hand polished. It's all machine. It's very automated. And they're going to take a few words of my wisdom on some of these cases and not do full polish on the stuff that's going to be inside of where we're going to bond. You know, we'll leave a rough surface. There's no need to. So Argon is a great partner to me in my laboratory. I would have probably come and spoke for them for nothing. You know, they, they're good people. I love them. And uh, I've been to their facility multiple times. They're just an innovative company that really have your back. So that's enough BSing at this point. All right, so you're going to get a little uh, sneak peek here. So I've been working on a passion project. It's not finished yet. Uh, we're going to be able to make that library that I, 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 I mentioned earlier. And it's going to allow you to take your pre-surgical and get a wax up very quickly utilizing facial uh, technology. And these are all cases that we just zipped out here in the last oh, three or four months. And I've come up with a library that's uh, matched to the face. Much like those denture teeth, as I mentioned, that square tapering, square tapering, ovoid, square tapering, ovoid. And this library is going to be very easy for you to align your pre-surgical coordinates to a facial scan and easily drag in a full complement of teeth, scale it like any other, volumetrically scaled, to fit the situation. How powerful is that to be able to get to your rendering quicker? I'd like to design one-offs every single day of my life. But what I've learned is I want to be more efficient when it doesn't degrade my quality in any way, shape, or form. So this library is going to be amazing. It's going to be just like any other library inside of 3Shape. You can click on it. It's going to come in, and you're going to be able to do whatever you want with it. 
and it's going to scale volumetrically and you're not going to have to do all the gingiva. You're not going to have to do any of the movements because it's all managed. So again, guys, I, I like to share my passion, share this stuff with you so that initially you can start thinking a little bit differently. I know when I go back to my, my lab after being around passionate people, it inspires me. It, it makes me want to learn more. I don't have all the answers, but I'm happy to share whatever wisdom that I have with you today. This is my uh, little pup, Maverick. And I think he's looking at me and said, Dad, you did halfway decent. Thanks, guys.